Hello everyone, I'm going to be talking about knives again today. In particular, I'm going to be talking about the four knives you're seeing, but some others as well. But these are in, I'm going to be talking about in particular because they are knives that are iconic in the world of bushcrafting, particularly for a person who is associated with, e with each of these knives. And I'll start with the first one here. Now, this is similar to a Nesmuk knife, and there are quite a few versions of it out there. This is the only one that I personally own. But George Washington Sears was an interesting fellow who later in life became ill, and he went and sought his health out in the woods. And he is the father of uh, ultralight bushcrafting, uh, sorry, uh, ultralight camping. Um, he had a super light canoe that he paddled with. Uh, in the Apple, uh, sorry, in the Adirondack area, and um, he wrote about his his travels in the wild in uh, Field and Stream. Uh, this was at a time in America when camping and getting out into the wild had, was recreational rather than necessity or looking for a new place to live or anything like that. So we're past the settlement area era and into the more settled period in America when people were looking for uh, solace and, and uh, peace and recreation and fun out in the woods and in the wilds. And so uh, he became popular and the the knife that he carried uh, now mostly bears his name, and it's very similar to this. It's got the long sweeping belly, um, and it's got this arched back here. And his knife didn't have this, this sharp here. It was more rounded, um, but it wasn't a terribly large knife. He didn't carry, any, carry anything more than he needed to, and it needed to be small enough and be useful. And he used his primarily for skinning game. Um, but whenever you talk about knives, the, the Nesmuk knife is one of those ones that comes up because people know who Nes Nesmuk was and they know what his knife is. And so if you say Nesmuk, they know what you're talking about because it's a particular knife that is very well known for the person who carried it. Now, chronologically, the next one that comes up is the Kephart, but I'm going to skip him first because most of the knives I'm going to be talking about today are about our Kepharts. So another very iconic person um, in the world of bushcraft is a fellow named Morris Kochansky, um, a Canadian who became a, uh, a, a very well-selling author. Um, his book on bushcraft is uh, has been published for many, many years, and he, he was well-respected as an instructor and teacher. Now, this isn't necessarily his knife, but this is a knife that is inspired by his description of the ideal knife. Um, he uh, was an interesting writer, um, and he uh, just recently passed away uh, in 2019. And um, so those who have seen or uh, talked about him and talked about the kind of knife that he would carry, um, you would recognize this or the Skookum Bushcraft, uh, sorry, the Skookum, what's that thing called? Um yeah, anyway, so, so the, the Skookum knife, um, which is very similar to this one. This one is made by the American Knife Company, uh, which uh, I believe they're actually made in the uh, the Bark River factory um, out of A2 steel. But what um, Moore's described as the perfect knife, he said it would be a knife of good quality carbon steel. This is A2 steel, which, you know, uh, it is a good quality uh, carbon steel. Uh, from two and a half to three millimeters thick, and I think this is a little on the thicker side, but but right in there, I don't think it's any more than three millimeters. Uh, about uh, two to two and a half centimeters wide. So in this width here, um, two and a half centimeters is, you know, in those of us who are metrically challenged is about an inch. And so this is about an inch wide. Um, the size of the blade, uh, let's see. Uh, and he said that this was this this thickness and this width was the size of blade that he preferred because it was light in weight and yet uh, strong enough to not break. Um, he said that the steel should be soft enough that you can sharpen it uh, to a shaving edge with cop uh, common sharpening tools without frequent uh, resharpening. And I think A2 kind of fits that bill. Um, it's somewhat easier to sharpen than some of the super steels out there. Maybe not as easy as 1095, but it is a good, uh, reliable steel to use in this type of a knife. Um, and he preferred carbon steels to stainless steels because they could be uh, used to strike a flint and steel and, um, be, and be used in that sort of a fire making. Um, 
He also said that the uh, blade, the knife should be full tang, that the blade should extend the full length of the handle for strength. Um, and he also said the knife, the, the knife handle should be about as big as the width of your palm. So, um, if this one's a little bigger than that, um, I think, you know, the handle could, could stand to be a little bit shorter. Um, but, uh, for people with larger hands, I'm sure that that will fit the bill. But one of the things that this does, particularly with this steel pommel here is that it, it allows you a full grip and yet still have this pommel free of your hand. Um, and he also said that the, the size of the blade should be a, t a typical Puko size, which is basically uh, no wider than the width of the palm of your hand. And so um, that this kind of fits the bill. And this was a knife that was designed uh, at least with Morris Kochansky in mind um, and inspired by his writings, um, as is the, the Skookum Bush tool. Now I'm going to talk about the, the another knife. Uh, another iconic person in the world of bushcraft is uh, the inimitable uh, Ray Mears. Um, I love watching his shows. And one of the knives that is um, just very much associated with him is what is called a, uh, a bushcrafting knife. And this is the Spyderco version of it. Um, and there are many different versions, but this is basically what um, uh, the, the bushcrafting knife is known as. And there are a couple of things about it. It's got a very comfortable handle. Um, the steel is O1 tool steel, which I think was the preferred steel by um, Ray Mears. At least that's what his knives were made in. My only issue with the O1 tool steel is that it does rust very easily, but it does take a wicked sharp edge and fairly easily. Um, and the other thing is that's what we call a Scandi grind where there is the blade is relatively just flat until you get to a single bevel right at the edge here, which is a preferred type of grind for Scandinavian knives or woodworking knives, um, and therefore something that Ray Mears would appreciate in his uh, woodsy type of uh, bushcrafting. Um, it does stain easily because it is O1 one steel, um, but it does sharpen easily as well, and it will hold the edge for a relatively good period of time. And so when people talk about Ray Mears, this is the kind of knife that they uh, associate with him. And now let's get to the last one, which is the uh, the Kephart. Now, um, Horace Kephart uh, was an, uh, an American, uh, a very well-educated man. He was a writer as well about um, the going out in the wild and camping. His book um, is also an iconic book. Uh, kind of like Morse Kuchansky's is, um, if you want to learn about uh, living off the land and camping. And he goes into extreme detail in how to set up tents, how to make tents, you know, and, and all sorts of things, and what kind of gear you should carry. And the knife that is associated with him, um, whenever we think about a, a Kephart knife, those of us who are into knives, we always think about a blade like this, which is basically a rather simple looking knife, kind of spear shaped where the point of the blade runs basically, or mostly, you know, at least as close as possible through the middle of the blade. The blade steel is not particularly thick, and the handle is very simplistic with, a, with one small kind of bump out here as a guard. And um, this is a Bark River version it's got a, a about a four inch long blade. Now, the knife that was actually made for Horace Kephart and so and, and was sold, it was made by the Colchester brothers. Um, it came in both a four and a five inch long blade, and those were the two lengths. And um, I, I think that he wouldn't have gone any longer than five inches. I think that those were the two preferred lengths for him. But of course, this is a modern iteration. The, this blade steel here is a, is a stainless steel, which would not have been available back um, in Horace's time. And Horace was in the uh, was active in writing around the um, the, the early half of the uh, 20th century. Um, and this one um, is a made, made out of uh, CPM 154, which is a very good quality stainless steel. It's got micarta handles and orange scales, uh, sorry, and orange liners on the scales. It's full tang, which um, the Kephart knife was. And lots of people have made an iteration of the Kephart. And so um, you have knives by people such as LT Wright, this is their bushcrafter knife, which obviously has many similarities um, with the the Kephart by uh, Bark River. This one, however, is made out of uh, A2 steel. Uh, it has that same basic kind of blade shape. However, the Kephart 
blade grind would not have been a Scandi like this. This is kind of a, a nod to the bushcraft knife by, um, by Ray Mears in that it's similar enough that you can kind of see the similarities there, but this is the Kephart design with the, the more spear-shaped blade and a simpler handle. Although instead of having a guard that bumps out like this, um, Welty Wright does theirs with a kind of a, a divot into the handle like that. But it also makes it a decent bushcrafting knife. But And it is, you know, it could be looked at and said, that's a Kephart. Um, other versions have come and gone, um, but one that is very, very interesting and gets to the history, and this is, and I, 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 I'm showing these in the order in which I acquired them. So this is... Um, as close as we can get to the actual Colchester original Kephart knife. Now, um, Ethan of Becker Knives was able to uh, acquire one of the original Colchester knives, and this is the reproduction based on his original knife. The handle is very close to original. It's very thin walnut scales. I like how it flares out here right before the blade and has a very uh, gentle and subtle bump out for a guard. This is a very simple handle, very, very effective. Um, and the blade is the, the same shape and size as the original. However, there is one uh, kind of glaring difference. The original was a double convex grind, meaning that it was convexed down to the edge here and then convexed to the spine as well. It was a blunt spine, but it also had some, it was also convexed so that it made a shape kind of like that. And the reason for that is, is that it allowed it to slice through things and not stick. Um, it made it a very, very slicey knife and very useful in that regard. Whereas this one is a simple flat grind with a secondary bevel. Um, I would have preferred that they do a, a convex kind of like Bark River did. But to have the double bevel convex, that would have been absolutely perfect. Um, but this is as close to the original as we can find. Um, it's a five inch blade, walnut scales. Um, and the one thing that also is not uh, true to the original is the fact that this has uh, these bolts instead of pins that would have gone through the handle. But this is kind of a nod to Ethan Becker and his knives, which always have these uh, bolts in the handle. And I took... Um, the blade style and I made one of my own as you can see here this is similar uh, it's got the same blade shape that kind of bluntish brutish spear type blade this one is convexed this one is made out of an old file and I divoted the handles right here so you can get close and kind of pinch the, the blade up close if you need to um, this is just the one that I made but there are others out there um, and if you want to talk about the history of the Kephart knife, it's hard not to look at the old Dadley knives. And the blade shape is there. And this blade shape, you know, Kephart did not invent the blade shape. Um, this blade shape has been around for centuries, if not millennia. Um, it was it, it existed pre colonial era, um, and we have pictures from people in the 1800s carrying knives very similar to this one, other than this one's made out of much higher modern, uh, higher quality modern materials, but it is very, very similar. And so you can see where Kephart got his inspiration. It's just that he modified it somewhat with the guard and the different type of handle scales. Um, this is also a Bark River knife. This one's made out of CPM 3V. It is very thin as the Dadley knives were. Um, Kephart's knife was a bit thicker. So it was a bit more robust, um, but there are other versions out there as well. Um, there's another Bark River for you, another large one. Um, this one comes closest to the one that I made, as, at least as far as blade length and all goes. Um, Bark River makes the handle larger. Mine handles oak, whereas this one's made out of curly maple. And it is quite thick, as is mine. And uh, this one's... Um, you know, made out of an old file, so it's probably 1095 or W2 or something like that. Whereas this one is made out of CPM 3V, which is a very strong tool steel and a very effective knife. Um, so there are also inexpensive Kephart knives out there, 
like this one here. This is one is made by uh, Condor out of El Salvador. Um, I got this one early on too, but I gave it uh, away. Um, it's an okay knife. Um, the shape and everything is quite, you know, is good. It does somewhat look, resemble a, a cut part, a, a cut part knife um, in the blade shape, um, and the handle's a bit thinner and shorter and all of that. But um, the thing about this one is it's made out of that uh, 1075 steel that Condor likes to use, which I am not a big fan of. It just doesn't hold an edge very long. It may be easy to put an edge on, but it doesn't hold it terribly long. And one of the things that I found that was kind of distressing is that. Um, I could actually take one of the blades um, that I have and actually carve a chunk out of this blade because it is so soft. Um, it's just a little bit distressing about um, that way. But, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, these knives are uh, quite a bit more expensive than than these, you know, less expensive ones from Condor. Um, and they just go up from there in price. Uh, this is probably the most expensive version I have with this Bark River here. But anyway, as you can see, I do like the, the Kephart knife style a lot, um, having quite a few uh, versions of it here at hand. But if you're in the, you know, out there and, and you're wanting to use, to get a, a bushcrafting knife, it's good to look at the knives that are used by the people who did it for a living. Morris Kachansky, Ray Mears, uh, Nesmuk and uh, Kephart and the knives that they preferred to use are not a bad place to start um, and you'll find that they have pluses and minuses there is no perfect knife out there but I think that the the Kephart is a good way to go um, because it is a good all-around knife you can use it for camp tasks you can use it for hunting you can use it for bushcrafting whatever you like anyway I'm not going to speak any more about this and I hope you have a good day